to week five class. This week, we're going to be talking about embedded formative assessment, one of the most important topics we're going to cover this semester. Your vocabulary preview just consists of three uh, phrases, and here it is. Don't forget you can always do the vocabulary template for extra credit. So one of the terms we're going to be using throughout the course is formal versus informal assessments. When we say this, formal assessments mean graded assessments. They might be quizzes, project tests. Informal assessments are generally not graded, such as questioning, observations. Uh, formal assessments may be formative, so for example, a quiz that you give to see how students are progressing in the unit, or summative, so it might be a, um, a formal graded end of unit test that's summative. So what is formative assessment? We've been using the words a little bit in course, in the course, uh, but now it's time to define it. Basically, it involves the gathering of evidence of student learning, mm -hmm. providing feedback to students, and adjusting instructional strategies to enhance achievement. Formative assessment most frequently occurs during the lesson or unit. And that's different than pure summative assessment, which usually occurs at the end of a lesson or unit and measures learning. There's a cycle to formative assessment. A student does some work. We formatively assess that work either through questioning or homework or pop quiz or something. We score it and evaluate the evidence and we make decisions about what type of feedback we need to give and perhaps we make some instructional adjustments. We slow down, speed up, reteach, uh, teach it in a different way. Student does work, etc. Formative assessment is constant. I can't think of a, a, an hour in my classroom where I wasn't doing some type of formative assessment. It's occurring all the time. Sometimes it's called instructional assessment. Uh, we're going to be talking about some, uh, lots of different types of formative assessment. Um, and many tools that we can use. So let's make clear that our book divides it up into two types, embedded formative and summative based formative. And this lecture is mostly on embedded formative. We'll get to summative based formative next week. Embedded formative consists of itself of two types. The first type is called on the fly, and that's just you're doing it all the time in the classroom. You're, um, you're questioning students, you're uh, holding classrooms discussions and seeing who understands what. So this is the spontaneous ongoing formative assessment that's occurring in the classroom. But there's also planned embedded formative. So you might pre-plan some questions to ask the class, for example, to see what they understand, or you might uh, pre-plan some homework, for example. Summative-based formative assessment that we're going to talk about next week is using summative assessment for the purpose of providing feedback, adjusting instruction, and documenting learning. So you might give a summative test, but you're still using it for formative decisions. Let's continue with embedded formative assessment and cover some different types of embedded formative assessment. The most common type, or one of the most common types, uh, is observations that go on in your classroom. This is very pervasive in your classroom. As you're teaching, you're walking around the classroom, you're noticing who's on task, you're noticing who might be slightly misbehaving, you might see someone chatting in the back of the room, so you go stand by them. You're assessing constantly, and this is formative assessment. It probably it's least formal. Um, you're looking at facial expressions to see if students are with you. Uh, you're, you're seeing who might be having a bad day. Maybe they look a bit glum or maybe they are angry. You're looking at body language. So perhaps you've introduced a writing assignment and there are several students who have put their heads down on their desk. All of these observations are embedded formal, formative assessment. You might also assess verbal behaviors including voice-related cues. So whose voice is going up? Who's uh, showing anxiety or stress? Who's relaxed and happy? Now, as we get better at making judgments about these nonverbal and verbal behaviors, we grow almost complacent. 
But I would urge you to be cautious because sometimes, because we approach these things from our own framework, it's easy to make mistakes. And your book has a very nice table of uh, ways to make errors in observations that's on page 123. For example, they might talk about, uh, they talk about number six, observer bias, where you might be biased in favor of a particular student or against a particular student, and you might over or underestimate that student. So I encourage you to read through that and make sure you understand that observation, while a, a, a good tool for teachers, isn't completely without its, um, its, its uh, dangers. A second kind of embedded formative assessment is informal oral questioning. And our book talks about how the average teacher asks 400 questions a day. And these questions can be divided up into four types. Questions you ask of your whole class, questions uh, that you ask while you're doing teacher-led reviews of content, interactions and questions with individual students and also with small groups of students. That's a lot of questions, so it's important to learn some questioning strategies, how to do it correctly. So here's some tips for questioning. First of all, don't make your questions so wordy. If you do, students are likely to, to drift off and, um, and not, get, not be with you when you reach the end of the question. Make questions uh, succinct and clear. Match your questions to your learning targets. So if, if your learning target is that students will be able to um, describe uh, the effects of, uh, of genocide, then you're going to center your questions around that learning target. You're going to involve the entire class. I find that it's very effective to do things such as some of you may use eye clickers, uh, devices that encourage the entire class to respond, but you don't have to invest in technology to get the same level of engagement. The, you can use a technique where you ask students to hold fingers in the air. For example, hold one finger if you think the answer is yes, hold two fingers if you think the answer is no. When I teach face-to-face, -face, I use whiteboards in my class and I have students write answers and hold them up on the whiteboards. And that way you can quickly gauge who's with you and who is, uh, ha is under some misconceptions. But involving the whole class, research suggests, seriously raises student engagement. One thing that teachers need to be aware of is that after they ask a question, they need to allow sufficient wait time. A good technique to do this is to count to seven. So ask your question and then it internally count one, two, three, etc. until you get to seven. At first, that's going to feel like a really long time because what teachers want to do is ask a question, jump in, give the answer, ask another question, call on someone. But the research suggests that if we give seven seconds of wait time, we're giving students time to think about what the answer may be. So don't repeat questions and don't rush into giving uh, another question or the answer. Space your questions. Avoid close yes, no questions. Uh, so don't, instead of asking, uh, is the sky blue? And then students would just have to say yes. Say, what color is the sky? Um, use probes to extend, um, use probes to extend answers. So can you explain what you mean by that? Or, um, Explain how you arrived at that solution. Can you give another example? So these are probes, and there are lots more about how you can extend answers. Avoid leading questions. So what this means is you don't want to ask students to, um, you don't want to ask students well and so um, and what else. Instead, Ask them very specific follow-ups. So can you explain what you mean by such and such and such? Avoid asking students what they think they know. So things like, is everybody with me? Because no one's going to admit that they're not with you. 
ask students questions in an appropriate sequence. So generally we go uh, from the, uh, the general to the specific, uh, not from the specific to the general. So introduce the topic, ask some general questions, and then get more and more specific. And finally, randomize calling. What this means is when we don't have a system for calling on individual students, we tend to call on students who are raising their hands. And so the stu same students get called on over and over again. But if we could randomize calling, well, some teachers might put all the names on slips of paper and then pull them out one by one. We know that we are more frequently calling on students and giving them practice answering. Students will stay on their toes then as well because they know they might get called on. A third type of embedded formative assessment is the written probe. This is, uh, for example, exit slips when st students have to write down something before they leave the classroom. KWL, uh, those preschool and kindergarten teachers know these well. What I want to know, what I know, what I want to know, what I learned. Lists or summaries, anytime basically you have students writing things to tell you what they know, that's a written probe. Activities can be embedded formative assessments. Cup colors, keeping a, asking students to keep a red and a green cup on their desk and their, put the green cup on top when they're with you and put the red cup on top when they're, they have a question or some teachers use green, yellow, and red. red. Green meaning I'm okay, yellow meaning mm, slow down a little bit, or red meaning I'm completely lost. Four corners is a fun game where you ask students to get up and go to four different corners depending on the questions they have. So you might point out a corner, <coughs> excuse me, and go and say, okay, go to that corner if you need a lot of help, go to corner two if you've mostly got it, go to corner three if you've got it, and go to four to corner four if you think you can help others. Games are fun, uh, spelling games, all kinds of games, uh, math games to, to see what students know and don't know. And finally, think, pair, and share is another fun activity, which is good for shy students. Basically, you have students turn to each other and uh, share what they're thinking the answer is. As you walk around the room, you can listen in on those conversations. Conferencing or meeting with individual students is another good way to formatively assess students' knowledge. When you give form, when you use formative assessment, it's important to incorporate feedback so that students can improve. Feedback is the transfer of information from the teacher to the student based on the assessment. Descriptive feedback is, is an important thing to do and to do well. So what is um, descriptive feedback? It's specific and appropriate communication to improve learning while that learning is occurring or evolving. It should focus on the particular qualities of student learning with discussion and suggestions about what the student can do to improve. It can be provided in the form of ideas, strategies, and tasks. Students can use to close the gap between his or her current level and the next level of learning. It's not in the form of a score or a grade, so feedback is not a grade. And it should help the student answer three questions. Where am I going? Where am I now? And how can I close the gap? When giving effective specific feedback, consider the amount. So. For a quick assignment, you don't have to write a lot of feedback. If you, they've worked harder and longer, you should provide a fair amount. Consider the timing, and it's usually good to provide feedback as soon as possible. The mode. You can give oral, written, or demonstration feedback, and that depends on the context. So, for example, if you're trying to teach a student how to use, um, how to use a microscope, you're going to and they're using it incorrectly, the feedback might consist of saying, here, do it like this, a demonstration. Most feedback in our classrooms is either going to be oral or written. Consider the audience and use developmentally appropriate language. You don't want to talk or write to a preschooler who can't read. You don't want to 
talk down to um, a college student. Consider the type of task. So if they're doing multiple choice tests, it probably doesn't require a ton of feedback, whereas a project would require more feedback because the subjective, the grading is more subjective. And consider the learner's ability. If a student's ability is such that she or he will never meet the high expectations of an assignment, give them feedback relative to their ability. So the idea is, if student A is at level one and student B is at level 10, you want to try to bring student A up to two or three, but you expect more out of the second student who's already at 11, who's already at 10. You want to get them to 11 or 12. So the feedback you give each student is going to be different. I'd like to spend a minute talking about mastery learning versus performance learning. <clears throat> This is based on the work of researchers such as Benjamin Bloom and Carol Dweck. Um, Carol Dweck divides, divides learners up into two types of learners. Mastery learners compare their work to some standard of mastery. They see their progress towards mastery and so are less likely to become discouraged if they hit a glitch. These are the students who tell you, oh, I can, I've gotten so much better at running. I can run much faster than I used to. Performance learners, on the other hand, compare their work to others' performance or to some artificial standards, such as grades. They see their status in black and white. So these are the students who say, oh, I'm so bad at math, I never get a good grade. They're so much more likely to become discouraged if they hit a glitch. We want to encourage an attitude towards mastery learning, learning in our classrooms because this is what encourages students to persevere. Surprisingly, one of the ways we can do this is by using effective feedback and praise. So what does good feedback look like? Well, first of all, it's not general. We don't say good job because the student doesn't really know what the good job is. Instead, we make it specific. You did a good job conjugating verbs on that assignment. It's internal attribute base, I'm sorry, it's standards based versus internal attribute based. So what does that mean? So we don't say you're good at math. That would be an internal attribute. We're trying to say a student is smart in math. Instead, we say we based it on a standard or, or learning target. I can tell you've mastered how to do two digit division. So this might seem um, counterintuitive because of course you would want to say to a student or you think you're so good at math. Um, but the problem with this is it can backfire. Let's think about that. Suppose I gave uh, a student a test, my students a test in math and Bobby gets 100 on math, and I hand his test back and I say, good job, Bobby, you're so smart at math. Well, Bobby equates that 100 with being smart in math, which is okay for then, but suppose a few weeks later, Bobby has another test and doesn't do as well, and he gets a 60 or a 70. Even if I just hand the test back and I don't say anything, Bobby may be thinking, oh, I'm not good at math anymore because I got a bad grade. So the student comes to equate scores with ability. And scores can fluctuate. But if we, if we talk about standards-based feedback, progress towards a learning target or a standard, the student comes to has, have a sense of accomplishment. And if they temporarily or, or even less than, you know, more permanently mess up, they're not likely to think I'm not good at that subject. <clears throat> they are more likely to think I have to work harder to master it. Good feedback is also, also encourages students to compare themselves with themselves versus others. So a bad feedback would be Sally understands better than anyone how to do this science experiment. And that's bad because it compares Sally with everybody else in the class. First of all, it's going to make every other student hate Sally, which is not fair to Sally. 
but also it's going to um, be counterproductive because Sally feels like she has to compete with the others. Instead, compare herself with herself. Sally, you have learned over the last month how to write hypotheses. So we're comparing where Sally is now at this skill with where she was a month ago. Good feedback offers a way to improve. So it's okay to say, nice job of counting those blocks. That is specific. But a better way is to say, nice job of counting those blocks. Try touching them one at a time as you say the numbers. So you're giving students a way to get better at the skill or task. So which of, what, let's go through these one at a time and see if they are effective or ineffective. Lynette, that was a great job you did yesterday. Is that effective or ineffective? It's ineffective. It's not specific or related to standards. How about Jeff? Your writing is improving. Your B's are much better because you're making a straighter line and not a loop. Is that effective or ineffective? It's effective because it's specific and descriptive, but you could include areas to improve as well. How about this one? Miguel, you did the best in class. It's ineffective. It's too general. It doesn't say what he was good at, and it compares his performance only to others and not to himself. How about this? John, I can see by your work you are really good in math. Is that effective or ineffective? It's ineffective. It's too general, and it attributes success to his internal ability, not to progress towards a standard. How about the final one? Good work. This time you double the length and width before adding them to find the perimeter of the rectangle. Is that effective or ineffective? It's effective, it's specific, descriptive, and it shows progress. It could offer another suggestion for improvement. The timing of the of feedback, there's been a lot of research on this, and we know that we don't want to give feedback to students while they're focused on the task because they're not going to hear you. Um, it's usually good to give immediate feedback for supporting procedures or conceptual knowledge. And when a student is learning a new task, immediate feedback is better. However, in the case of more difficult tasks involving greater amounts of processing, delayed feedback provides more opportunity for students to process. Low achieving students benefit from immediate feedback, particularly when they are learning new concepts or skills. So to summarize, immediate feedback is most often the best uh, way to go. But if something is longer and something is taking more time, then it's okay to delay it a little bit to give students time to process. What about praise? We've been talking a lot about feedback, but praise is also important to give students for the purpose of encouraging them. Like feedback, you want to direct praise towards students' progress and performance in relation to standards. One method that some teachers use and I've used effectively in the past is called the hamburger method. Think of the, it in three parts. There's a top bun and the top bun consists of praise. So you want to praise something about the student's work. The meat consists of constructive feedback, and the bottom bun consists of more praise. So, for example, if a student turns in an improved homework assignment in math, you might say, Susie, I really like the way you wrote legibly on this homework. Your handwriting has definitely improved. Do you see problem number four? And have you considered that if you move the denominator decimal point over to the right one, it will help with your division? Again, this homework has improved over your last score. Did you catch the two pieces of praise and the one piece of feedback in the middle? That's the hamburger method. So that's it for this week for embedded formative assessment. I hope that you see that there are many, many types of formative assessment 
and that your eyes may be opening to all the assessment that goes on in the classroom. Have a great week and enjoy the rest of the module.